Hello friends, happy Friday, on we go with the play gear from page 170, this is excellent content Simon, 176 to 189. We hear about the narrator becoming an examiner, which basically means going up to people's houses and going, hello, do you have the plague? Do they have the plague? I know, what a terrible system for three weeks. Um, and then, towards the end of this passage, everyone finally gives up hope of surviving, which turns out to be a lot jollier than you might expect, according to this account anyway. So, I, let's proceed. Without further ado. This counts as a do, guys. Cut the ado. This running of distempered people about the streets was very dismal, and the magistrates did their utmost to prevent it. But as it was generally in the night, and always sudden when such attempts were made, the officers could not be at hand to prevent it. And even when any got out in the day, the officers appointed did not care to meddle with them, because as they were all grievously infected, to be sure, when they were come to that height, so they were more than ordinarily infectious, and it was one of the most dangerous things that could be to touch them. On the other hand, they generally ran on, not knowing what they did, till they dropped down stark dead or till they had exhausted their spirits, so that they would fall and then die in perhaps half an hour or an hour. And which was most piteous to hear, they were sure to come to themselves entirely in that half hour or hour, and then to make most grievous and piercing cries and lamentations in the deep, afflicting sense of the condition they were in. This was much of it before the order for shutting up of houses was strictly put in execution, for at first the watchmen were not so vigorous and severe as they were afterward in the keeping the people in, that is to say, before they were, I mean, some of them, severely punished for their neglect, failing in their duty, and letting people who were under their care slip away, or conniving at their going abroad, whether sick or well. But after they saw the officers appointed to examine into their conduct were resolved to have them do their duty or be punished for the omission, they were more exact, and the people were strictly restrained which was a thing they took so ill and bore so impatiently that their discontents can hardly be described. But there was an absolute necessity for it, that must be confessed, unless some other measures had been timely entered upon, and it was too late for that. Had not this particular, of the sick being restrained as above, been our case at that time, London would have been the most dreadful place that ever was in the world. There would, for aught I know, have as many people died in the streets as died in their houses, for when the distemper was at its height, it generally made them raving and delirious, and when they were so, they would never be persuaded to keep in their beds but by force, and many who were not tied threw themselves out of windows when they found they could not get leave to go out of their doors. It was for want of people conversing one with another in this time of calamity that it was impossible any particular person could come at the knowledge of all the extraordinary cases that occurred in different families, and particularly I believe it was never known to this day how many people in their deliriums drowned themselves in the Thames, and in the river which runs from the marshes by Hackney, which we generally call Ware River or Hackney River. As to those which were set down in the weekly bill, they were indeed few, nor could it be known of any of those whether they drowned themselves by accident or not. But I believe I might reckon up more who within the compass of my knowledge or observation really drowned themselves in that year than are put down in the bill of all put together. For many of the bodies were never found, who yet were known to be lost, and the like in other methods of self-destruction. There was also one man in or about Whitecross Street burned himself to death in his bed. Some said it was done by himself, others that it was by the treachery of the nurse that attended him, but that he had the plague upon him was agreed by all. It was a merciful disposition of providence also, and which I have many times thought of at that time, that no fires, or no considerable ones at least, happened in the city during that year, which, if it had been otherwise, would have been very dreadful. And either the people must have let them alone unquenched, or have come together in great crowds and throngs, unconcerned at the danger of the infection, not concerned at the houses they went into, at the goods they handled, or at the persons or people they came among. But so it was that, excepting that in Cripplegate Parish, and two or three little eruptions of fires which were presently extinguished, there was no disaster of that kind happened in the whole year. They told us a story of a house in a place called Swan Alley, passing from Goswell Street, near the end of Old Street, into St John Street that a family was infected there in so terrible a manner that every one of the house died. The last person lay dead on the floor, and, as it is supposed, had lain herself all along to die just before the fire. The fire, it seems, had fallen from its place, being of wood, 
and had taken hold of the boards and the joists they lay on, and burnt as far as just to the body, but had not taken hold of the dead body, though she had little more than her shift on, and had gone out of itself, not burning the rest of the house, though it was a slight timber house. How true this might be, I do not determine, but the city being to suffer severely the next year by fire, this year it felt very little of that calamity. Indeed, considering the deliriums which the agony threw people into, and how I have mentioned in their madness when they were alone they did many desperate things, it was very strange there were not more disasters of that kind. It has been frequently asked me, and I cannot say that I ever knew how to give a direct answer to it, how it came to pass that so many infected people appeared abroad in the streets at the same time that the houses which were infected were so vigilantly searched, and all of them shut up and guarded as they were. I confess I know not what answers to give to this, unless it be this, that in so great and populous a city as this is, it was impossible to discover every house that was infected as soon as it was so, or to shut up all the houses that were infected, so that people had the liberty of going about the streets, even where they pleased, unless they were known to belong to such and such infected houses. It is true that, as several physicians told my Lord Mayor, the fury of the contagion was such at some particular times, and people sickened so fast and died so soon that it was impossible, and indeed to no purpose, to go about to inquire who was sick and who was well, or to shut them up with such exactness as the thing required, almost every house in a whole street being infected, and in many places every person in some of the houses. And that which was still worse, by the time that the houses were known to be infected, most of the persons infected would be stone dead, and the rest run away for fear of being shut up so that it was to very small purpose to call them infected houses and shut them up, the infection having ravaged and taken its leave of the house before it was really known that the family was anyway touched. This might be sufficient to convince any reasonable person that as it was not in the power of the magistrates or of any human methods of policy to prevent the spreading of the infection, so that this way of shutting up of houses was perfectly insufficient for that end. Indeed, it seemed to have no manner of public good in it equal or proportional to the grievous burden that it was to the particular families that were so shut up. And as far as I was employed by the public in directing that severity, I frequently found occasion to see that it was incapable of answering that end. For example, as I was desired, as a visitor or examiner, to inquire into the particulars of several families which were infected, we scarce came to any house where the plague had visibly appeared in the family, but that some of the family were fled and gone. The magistrates would resent this, and charge the examiners with being remiss in their examination or inspection. But by that means, houses were long infected before it was known. Now, as I was in this dangerous office but half the appointed time, which was two months, it was long enough to inform myself that we were no way capable of coming at the knowledge of the true state of any family but by inquiring at the door or of the neighbours. As for going into every house to search, that was a part no authority would offer to impose on the inhabitants or any citizen would undertake for it would have been exposing us to certain infection and death, and to the ruin of our own families as well as of ourselves. Nor would any citizen of probity, and that could be depended upon, have stayed in the town if they had been made liable to such a severity. Seeing then that we would come at the certainty of things by no method but that of inquiry of the neighbours or of the family, and on that we could not justly depend, it was not possible but that the uncertainty of this matter would remain as above. It is true masters of families were bound by the order to give notice to the examiner of the place wherein he lived within two hours after he should discover it of any person being sick in his house, that is to say having signs of infection. But they found so many ways to evade this and excuse their negligence that they seldom gave that notice till they had taken measures to have everyone escape out of the house who had a mind to escape, whether they were sick or sound. And while this was so, it is easy to see that the shutting up of houses was no way to be depended upon as a sufficient method for putting a stop to the infection, because... As I have said elsewhere, many of those that so went out of those infected houses had the plague really upon them, though they might really think themselves sound. And some of these were the people that walked the streets till they fell down dead, not that they were suddenly struck with a distemper, as with a bullet that killed with a stroke, but that they really had the infection in their blood long before, only that as it preyed secretly on the vitals, it appeared not till it seized the heart with a mortal power, and the patient died in a moment, as with a sudden fainting or an apoplectic fit. I know that some even of our physicians thought for a time that those people that so died in the streets were seized but that moment they fell, as if they had been touched by a stroke from heaven as men are killed by a flash of lightning, but they found reason to alter their opinion afterward, for upon examining the bodies of such after they were dead, they always either had tokens upon them or other evident proofs of the distemper having been longer upon them than they had otherwise expected. This often was the reason that, as I have said, we that were examiners were not able to come at the knowledge of the infection being entered into a house till it was too late to shut it up, 
and sometimes not till the people that were left were all dead. In Petticoat Lane, two houses together were infected, and several people sick. But the distemper was so well concealed, the examiner, who was my neighbour, got no knowledge of it till notice was sent him that the people were all dead, and that the cart should call there to fetch them away. The two heads of the families concerted their measures, and so ordered their matters, as that when the examiner was in the neighbourhood, they appeared generally at a time, and answered, that is, lied, for one another, or got some of the neighbourhood to say that they were all in health, and perhaps knew no better, till, death making it impossible to keep it any se longer as a secret, the dead carts were called in the night to both the houses, and so it became public. But when the examiner ordered the constable to shut up the houses, there was nobody left in them but three people, two in one house and one in the other, just dying, and a nurse in each house who acknowledged that they had buried five before, that the houses had been infected nine or ten days, and that for all the rest of the two families, which were many, they were gone, some sick, some well, or whether sick or well could not be known. In like manner, at another house in the same lane, a man having his family infected but very unwilling to be shut up when he could conceal it no longer, shut up himself. That is to say, he set the great red cross upon his door with the words, Lord have mercy upon us, and so deluded the examiner, who supposed it had been done by the constable by order of the other examiner, for there were two examiners to every district or precinct. By this means, he had free egress and regress into his house again, and out of it as he pleased, notwithstanding it was infected till at length his stratagem was found out, and then he, with the sound part of his servants and family, made off and escaped, so they were not shut up at all. These things made it very hard, if not impossible, as I have said, to prevent the spreading of an infection by the shutting up of houses, unless the people would think the shutting of their houses no grievance, and be so willing to have it done as that they would give notice duly and faithfully to the magistrates of their being infected as soon as it was known by themselves. But as that cannot be expected from them, and the examiners cannot be supposed, as above, to go into their houses to visit and search, all the good of shutting up houses will be defeated, and few houses will be shut up in time except those of the poor who cannot conceal it, and of some people who will be discovered by the terror and consternation which the things put them into. I got myself discharged of the dangerous office I was in as soon as I could get another admitted, whom I had obtained for a little money to accept of it, and so, instead of serving the two months which was directed, I was not above three weeks in it, and a great while too, considering it was in the month of August, at which time the distemper began to rage with great violence at our end of the town. In the execution of this office, I could not refrain speaking my opinion among my neighbours as to this shutting up the people in their houses, in which we saw most evidently the severities that we used, though grievous in themselves, had also this particular objection against them, namely, that they did not answer the end, as I have said, but that the distempered people went day by day about the streets, and it was our united opinion that a method to have removed the sound from the sick in case of a particular house being visited would have been much more reasonable on many accounts, leaving nobody with the sick persons but such as should on such occasion request to stay and declare themselves content to be shut up with them. Our scheme for removing those that were sound from those that were sick was only in such houses as were infected, and confining the sick was no confinement. Those that could not stir would not complain while they were in their senses, and while they had the power of judging. Indeed, when they came to be delirious and light-headed, then they would cry out of the cruelty of being confined. But for removal of those that were well, we thought it highly reasonable and just for their own sakes that they should be removed from the sick, and that for other people's safety they should keep retired for a while to see that they were sound and might not infect others, and we thought twenty or thirty days enough for this. Now, certainly, if houses had been provided on purpose for those that were sound to perform this demi-quarantine in, they would have much less reason to think themselves injured in such a restraint than in being confined with infected people in the houses where they lived. It is here, however, to be observed that after the funerals became so many that people could not toll the bell, mourn or weep, or wear black for one another as they did before, no, nor so much as make coffins for those that died. So after a while the fury of the infection appeared to be so increased that, in short, they shut up no houses at all. It seemed enough that all the remedies of that kind had been used till they were found fruitless, and that the plague spread itself with an irresistible fury. So that as the fire the succeeding year spread itself, and burned with such violence so that the citizens in despair gave over their endeavours to extinguish it, so in the plague it came at last to such violence that the people sat still looking at one another and seemed quite abandoned to despair. Whole streets seemed to be desolated, and not to be shut up only, but to be emptied of their inhabitants. Doors were left open, windows stood shattering with the wind in empty houses for want of people to shut them. 
In a word, people began to give up themselves to their fears and to think that all regulations and methods were in vain and that there was nothing to be hoped for but an universal desolation. And it was even in the height of this general despair that it pleased God to stay his hand and to slacken the fury of the contagion in such a manner as was even surprising like its beginning and demonstrated it to be his own particular hand and that above, if not without the agency of means, as I shall take notice of in its proper place. But I must still speak of the plague as in its height, raging even to desolation, and the people under the most dreadful consternation, even, as I have said, to despair. It is hardly credible to what excess the passions of men carried them in this extremity of the distemper, and this part, I think, was as moving as the rest. What could affect a man in his full power of reflection, and what could make deeper impressions on the soul, than to see a man almost naked, and go out of his house, or perhaps out of his bed, into the street, come out of Harrow Alley, a populous conjunction or collection of alleys, courts and passages in the Butcher Row and Whitechapel, I say, what could be more affecting than to see this poor man come out into the open street, run dancing and singing and making a thousand antic gestures, with five or six women and children running after him, crying and calling upon him for the Lord's sake to come back, and entreating the help of others to bring him back, but all in vain, and nobody daring to lay a hand upon him or to come near him. This was a most grievous and afflicting thing to me, who saw it all from my own windows. For all this while the poor afflicted man was, as I observed it, even then in the utmost agony of pain, having, as they said, two swellings upon him which could not be brought to break or to separate. But by laying strong caustics on them, and surgeons had, it seems, hopes to break them, which caustics were then upon him, burning his flesh as with a hot iron. I cannot say what became of this poor man, but I think he continued roving about in that manner till he fell down and died. No wonder the aspect of the city itself was frightful. The usual concourse of people in the streets, and which used to be supplied from our end of the town, was abated. The exchange was not kept shut, indeed, but it was no more frequented. The fires were lost. They had been almost extinguished for some days by a very smart and hasty rain. But that was not all. Some of the physicians insisted that they were not only no benefit, but injurious to the health of people. This they made a loud clamour about, and complained to the Lord Mayor about it. On the other hand, others of the same faculty, and eminent too, opposed them, and gave their reasons why the fires were, and must be, useful to assuage the violence of the distemper. I cannot give a full account of their arguments on both sides, only this I remember, that they cavilled very much with one another. Some were for fires, but that they must be of wood and not coal, and of particular sorts of wood too, such as fir in particular, or cedar, because of the strong effluvia of turpentine. Others were for coal and not wood, because of the sulphur and bitumen and others were for neither one or other. Upon the whole, the Lord Mayor ordered no more fires, and especially on this account, namely, that the plague was so fierce that they saw evidently it defied all means, and rather seemed to increase than decrease upon any application to check and abate it. And yet this amazement of the magistrates proceeded rather from want of being able to apply any means successfully than from any unwillingness either to expose themselves or undertake the care and weight of business. For to do them justice, they neither spared their pains nor their persons, but nothing answered. The infection raged, and the people were now frighted and terrified to the last degree, so that, as I may say, they gave themselves up, and, as I mentioned above, abandoned themselves to their despair. But let me observe here that, when I say the people abandoned themselves to despair, I do not mean to what men call a religious despair, or a despair of their eternal state, but I mean a despair of their being able to escape the infection or to outlive the plague which they saw was so raging and so irresistible in its force that indeed few people that were touched with it in its height about August and September escaped, and which is very particular, contrary to its ordinary operation in June and July, and the beginning of August when I have observed many were infected and continued so many days, and then went off after having had the poison in their blood a long time. But now, on the contrary, most of the people who were taken during the last two weeks in August and in the first three weeks in September generally died in two or three days at furthest, and many the very same day they were taken. Whether the dog days, or as our astrologers pretended to express themselves, the influence of the dog star, had that malignant effect, or all those who had the seeds of the infection before in them brought it up to a maturity at that time altogether, I know not. But this was the time when it was reported that above 3,000 people died in one night. And they that would have us believe, if they more critically observed it, pretend to say that they all died within the space of two hours, viz. between the hours of one and three in the morning. As to the suddenness of people's dying at this time more than before, there were innumerable instances of it, and I could name several in my neighbourhood. One family without the bars, and not far from me, were all seemingly well on Monday, being ten in family. 
That evening one maid and one apprentice were taken ill and died the next morning, when the other apprentice and two children were touched, whereof one died the same evening and the other two on Wednesday. In a word, by Saturday at noon the master, mistress, four children and four servants were all gone, and the house left entirely empty, except an ancient woman who came in to take charge of the goods for the master of the family's brother, who lived not far off, and who had not been sick. Many houses were then left desolate, all the people being carried away dead, and especially in an alley farther on the same side between the bars, going in at the side of Moses and Aaron, there were several houses together which, they said, had not one person left alive in them, and some that died last in several of those houses were left a little too long before they were fetched out to be buried. The reason of which was not, as some have written very untruly, that the living were not sufficient to bury the dead, but that the mortality was so great in the yard or alley that there was nobody left to give notice to the buriers or sextons that there were any dead bodies there to be buried. It was said, how true I know not, that some of those bodies were so much corrupted and so rotten that it was with difficulty they were carried. And as the carts could not come any nearer than to the alley gate in the high street, it was so much the more difficult to bring them along. But I'm not certain how many bodies were then left. I'm sure that ordinarily it was not so. As I have mentioned how the people were brought into a condition to despair of life and abandon themselves, so this very thing had a strange effect among us for three or four weeks. That is, it made them bold and venturous. They were no more shy of one another or restrained within doors, but went anywhere and everywhere and began to converse. One would say to another, I do not ask you how you are or say how I am. It is certain we shall all go. So it is no matter who is all sick or who is sound. And so they ran desperately into any place or any company. As it brought the people into public company, so it was surprising how it brought them to crowd into the churches. They inquired no more into whom they sat near to or to far from, what offensive smells they met with, or what condition the people seemed to be in. But looking upon themselves all as so many dead corpses, they came to the churches without the least caution and crowded together as if their lives were of no consequence compared to the work which they came about there. Indeed, the zeal which they showed in coming, and the earnestness and affection they showed in their attention to what they heard, made it manifest what a value people would all put upon the worship of God if they thought every day they attended the church that it would be their last. Nor was it without other strange effects, for it took away all manner of prejudice at or scruple about the person whom they found in the pulpit when they came to the churches, it cannot be doubted but that many of the ministers of the parish churches were cut off among others in so common and dreadful a calamity, and others had not courage enough to stand it, but removed into the country as they found means for escape. As then some parish churches were quite vacant and forsaken, the people made no scruple of desiring such dissenters as had been a few years before deprived of their livings by virtue of the Act of Parliament called the Act of Uniformity to preach in the churches. Nor did the church ministers in that case make any difficulty of accepting their assistance so that many of those whom they called silenced ministers had their mouths opened on this occasion and preached publicly to the people. Here we may observe, and I hope it will not be amiss to take notice of it, that a near view of death would soon reconcile men of good principles one to another, and that it is chiefly owing to our easy situation in life and our putting these things far from us that our breaches are fermented, ill blood continued, prejudices, breach of charity and of Christian union so much kept and so far carried on among us as it is. Another plague year would reconcile all these differences. A close conversing with death or with diseases that threaten death would scum off the gall from our tempers, remove the animosities among us, and bring us to see with differing eyes than those with which he looked on things with before. As the people who had been used to join with the church were reconciled at this time with admitting the dissenters to preach to them, so the dissenters, who with an uncommon prejudice had broken off from the communion of the Church of England, were now content to come to their parish churches and to conform to the worship which they did not approve of before. But as the terror of the infection abated, those things all returned again to their less desirable channel and to the course they were in before. I mention this but historically. I have no mind to enter into arguments to move either or both sides to a more charitable compliance one with another. I do not see that it is probable such a discourse would be either suitable or successful. The breaches seem rather to widen and tend to be widening further than to closing. And who am I that I should think myself able to influence either one side or other? But this I may repeat again, that it is evident death will reconcile us all. On the other side, the grave, we shall be brethren again. In heaven, whither I hope we may come from all parties and persuasions, we shall find neither prejudice or scruple. There we shall be of one principle and of one opinion. 
Why we cannot be content to go hand in hand to the place where we shall join heart and hand without the least hesitation, and without the most complete harmony and affection, I say, why we cannot do so here, I can say nothing to. Neither shall I say anything more of it, but that it remains to be lamented. And there I'll stop for today on page 189. Yesterday's video is there. Tomorrow's is up there. If you want to leave a tip, there's a little link below there. Thank you to everyone who's commented. Thank you to those who have tipped. And thank you for watching. I hope you're all doing tremendously. Bye-bye.